you are calling in remotely, if you would please uh, unmute your mic and answer that you are here when I call your name. Uh, Mr. Pepper. Here. Mr. Lawless. Here. Ms. Karpenick. Here. Mr. Newton. Here. Awesome, and we would uh, like to welcome Logan Newton as our newest member. Uh, welcome him remotely, and sorry that we can't be all here in person to welcome you in person. Hopefully that will happen soon, but we sure are glad to have you on our board and congratulate you on your appointment. I appreciate it. Looking forward to serving with you all. Did I miss uh, anyone? I know that um, I believe that uh, Ms. Davis is running a little bit late, and we'll uh, let her announce her presence when she uh, joins our meeting. But uh, in the meantime, we have established a quorum, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Lamb. Good afternoon, everyone. The Metropolitan Board of Zoning Appeals is now in session for the regularly scheduled meeting of May 7, 2020. My name is Emily Lamb, and I will be presenting the cases to the board for their review in today's public hearing. We are convened electronically pursuant to Governor Lee's Executive Order No. 16 in order to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak and still conduct essential business of the Metropolitan Government. Before we move on with the meeting, the Governor's Executive Order requires a motion to proceed electronically. Staff would solicit, would solicit a motion related to that effect. I make a motion. Is that Mr. Lawless? It is, sir. All right, I have a motion for Mr. Lawless. Is there a second? Second for Mr. Pepper. All right, I have a motion for Mr. Lawless, second for Mr. Pepper. Uh, we'll do a roll, roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Karpenick? Uh, in favor. Uh, Mr. Newton? In favor. Uh, Mr. Pepper? In favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. And I'll vote in favor as well, so that motion passes. We are able to have an electronic meeting. All right. In order to convene this meeting pursuant to that executive order, board members are participating remotely, and we encourage members of the public to submit comments in support or opposition to the board electronically at bza at nashville.gov. We extended the deadline to submit these comments, and any comments received by 12 noon yesterday, Wednesday, May 6th, were provided to the board for consideration prior to today's hearing. Any comments received after 12 noon yesterday will be read into the record. I am here at the Sunny West Conference Room at a station that has been set up for anyone who wishes to address the board. Social distance measures have been implemented. We have a um, podium here for members to come and speak to the board, and there's also some hand sanitizer there for anyone who's at the, board, uh, at the podium to use. For these public hearings, the board reviews the correspondence submitted in support of and opposition to these cases. The board also reviews co correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for the hearing. In today's hearing, staff will present the site plans, maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the case record. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, if anyone is here wishing to speak in support of the appeal, they may do so. If any opposition is present, the board will then hear from those parties. After the opposition presents its testimony, the appellant will have a period for rebuttal. According to the BZA rules, the appellant has five minutes for presentation if no opposition is present. In contested cases, the BZA rules allow 10 minutes for each side to present testimony. Should the appellant wish to provide rebuttal testimony, the appellant should reserve some portion of the allotted 10 minutes. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate telephonically and then vote on that case. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, Section 174180. All sections that we refer to come from the Metro Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. The Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1st, 1998. I will introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it a part of today's record. The Metro Co Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because BZA meetings are recorded for the Metro Nashville Network and because the board is hearing cases telephonically, it's imperative that anyone addressing the board come fo forward to the podium here at the Sunny West Conference Room and speak into the microphone. All speakers should identify themselves by name and address and then make the desired presentation. The Metro Code requires four members of our seven-member board to establish a quorum. The code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. In the event that five or more members are present, but the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. 
Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing shall be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to Chancery or Circuit Court within 60 days of the entry of a BZA order. Additionally, as per the BZA rules, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing by the BZA within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final and no further action can be taken. If your appeal is granted, you are required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A permit must be obtained within two years for board approval to remain valid. It should also be noted that if false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. I do have some preliminary announcements regarding deferrals and withdrawals. First, case 2019-300 has been deferred to May 21st. Case 2020-073 has been deferred to June 4th. Case 2019-075 has been deferred to June 4th. Case 2000, I'm sorry, I said 2019. I meant 2020-075. Case 2020-088 has been deferred to May 21st. And finally, case 2020-117 has been withdrawn. General announcement regarding BZA cases during this time we're meeting telephonically. At this point, all item A and item D appeals will be deferred until we are able to meet in person. Of course, as with everything in life these days, that is subject to change, and we will be sure to notify the board and the public at the earliest possible time if that changes, as well as the date that the cases will be heard. For the members of the public, our board utilizes a consent agenda at each of its meetings. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies those cases which meet the criteria for the requested action by the appellant. If the reviewing board member determines that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts in any substantial way, then the case is recommended to the board for approval. The consent agenda was published on May 1st, 2020, so anyone wishing to pull an item from consent could do so electronically. We did not receive any requests to pull anything from the previously published consent agenda. However, as previously stated, we are here at the station set up at the Sunny West Conference Room for anyone wishing to appear in person to pull an item from the consent agenda. We will enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended, and if anyone is here in opposition, please identify yourself, make sure I see you, and we'll pull the uh, item from consent and hear it in its regular order. Mr. Chairman, the items identified for consent agenda, case 2020-072 involving property at 1015, 1017, 1021, 1023 14th Avenue North, and 1308 Jackson Street. This is a request for a special exception to provide off-site parking for a religious institution. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 072? Seeing none here present, uh, we'll move on to case 2020-080 involving property at 324 Plus Park Boulevard. This is a request for a parking variance to construct a hotel. This is recommended for consent with the condition that the hotel will operate a shuttle service to transport their guests to and from the air airport as well as to and from area businesses, as was indicated in their supporting documentation. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 080? Seeing none, uh, last case for consent, case 2021-10 involving property at 805B Cherokee Avenue. This is a request for variances from the build to zone, landscape buffer and parking requirements to build a multifamily development. This uh, case property was previously approved by this board in 2017, that approval has expired and so they're asking for the same thing that was previously approved. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 110? Seeing none, to review the cases on consent agenda are case 2020-072, 2020-080, 2021-10. Mr. Chairman, we would solicit a vote from the board at this time. Right, there's a motion, if there's a second, if you'd hit your right hand button. Was that? Mr. Lawless? It was, and I can't find my little raise hand button. Sorry. Okay. I, I think it may be at the lower right uh, underneath <laughs> all the list of names. Um, but there is a second, and I will also note that uh, Ms. Davis joined us a little bit ago, and so I will, uh, since there's a motion and a second, I'll ask if there's any uh, discussion 
on the motion or any of the cases that are on the consent agenda. If you have, uh, again, members, just remember to hit your hit the raise hand button if you'd like to speak. Uh, I don't see any, and so I'll start with Ms. Davis, who can announce her presence and vote. Ms. Davis, it looks like you're still on mute. Good afternoon, Chairman and the board. I vote in favor. Great, uh, Ms. Karpenick. In favor. Uh, Mr. Newton. In favor. Mr. Pepper. In favor. Mr. Lala. In favor. And I will vote in favor. So that motion passes unanimously and the consent agenda is adopted. Mr. Chairman, at this point, we usually call on council members and take an, uh, or any other elected officials to give them an opportunity to address the board. I don't see anyone here um, who wants to address the board at this point. So absent any other announcements, we're ready to proceed to the cases with the cases to be heard. All right, first case. Let me go. First case for the board to consider is case 2020-007. This is involving property 234 Orlando Avenue. This is a request from street setback requirements to construct a new two family residence. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property is R6. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. This is a site plan submitted by the applicant. And finally, the current conditions of the property. There is opposition here, so each side will have 10 minutes to address the board. I do have one letter to read from a council member that was received this afternoon, if I could read that. Yes, please. Um, this is from Council Lady Berkeley Allen. It says, Dear Members of the Board of Zoning Appeals, I'm writing concerning case 2020-007, asking for a setback variance for a proposed home at 234 Orlando Avenue. Because the district council member lives within a block of this property, she asked me to act as a council member for this case. I attended a meeting of the White Bridge Neighborhood Association on January 13th and explained the process for getting a variance and the standards that were used to determine if one should be granted. After extensive discussion, it was agreed by the neighbors that the proposed project did not appear to them to meet the criteria of a hardship or a unique situation, since many of the homes in the neighborhood share the same topography and are adjacent to the creek. They voted not to support the variance request. On February 28th, the property owner asked me to meet on site to discuss a new design and hoped that it would be acceptable to the neighbors. After that meeting, I agreed to forward the plans to the neighbors for their feedback and to ask about setting up another meeting with them. While the proposed design of the home was architecturally compatible with the neighborhood, the setback location was unchanged and the neighbors informed me that they still did not see sufficient cause to grant a variance. While I appreciate the efforts of the owners to make revisions to the design to conform with neighboring architecture, I support the neighbors in their assessment that the revised design still does not meet the test for a variance, and I hope you will encourage the owner to consider a smaller dwelling that will fit within the allowed setback. Sincerely, Berkeley Allen, Metro Council at Large. Having read that, the applicant can come forward to the podium uh, to address the board. As I said, you'll have 10 minutes because there is opposition present. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Yep, and uh, the mic is, it's, you don't have to touch that mic. It's, just, it's automatically picking you up. Okay. Good, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Joe and Argus from Walter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, this, this case, and I submitted to you a PowerPoint, and not necessarily a, a proposal on this one, if you guys may not be able to see it, but I, my uh, can, can you speak up, please? Yes, sir, I'll do my best to. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, I, I submit to you, uh, I, I would disagree with Council Lady Allen's uh, submission that there's no hardship in this case. My client's property is the classic definition of hardship under all zoning textbooks and zoning case law, uh, the buildable area without a setback variant that's listed in here, uh, members of the board, would leave a approximately a 195 square foot buildable pad on this lot. This lot is 37,000 square feet in size and is encumbered by floodplain and floodway, as well as in the site plans, if you'll notice, the parking area, the fourth parking space has a 20-foot uh, sewer easement that runs through this. So uh, we are proposing to reduce the setbacks from 20 feet down to five. 
to allow our clients some space to build on this property. Uh, as stated, I'll remind the board members that the uh, standards for variance uh, listed out in, in the Metro Code of Law talks about uh, unique characteristics of the property. I've submitted evidence to you. Uh, there is no more unique property in this area uh, that is encumbered almost the vast majority of the property with uh, stormwater issues, sewer lines, and uh, without variance, this lot would not be built. Going to again, looking at the, uh, the code requirements, uh, this hardship not be self-imposed. There's no action by my owner uh, that would have uh, created this hardship. Uh, to the contrary, this owner joined with the owners to the north who closed a former right-of-way at the north part of the property, uh, providing them additional space to construct uh, a residence. So again, uh, he's taken actions to try to improve the situation here. Uh, he has met with the neighbors uh, in an attempt to work out the uh, aesthetic component uh, that Council Lady Allen talked about. And uh, I'll save the uh, balance of my time for rebuttal, uh, or if you have any questions for me or either the civil engineer, Mr. Garrigan, who's present, or the landowner himself. Yeah, Joey, I have a, a question. Um, could you tell me, it looks like the, the property line uh, is further from the road is how far from the road would the construction be that's the first question and then the second question i have is how much of this hardship is based on the choice of the property owner to build two units versus a single family home i mean i know by right they can build sure. two but it seems that my struggle with this request is uh, you know, it, there's clearly a hardship on this lot, but I'm not sure if what that, you know, the, the, the choice is choosing two. Sure, let, let me take them in reverse order if I could. The, the overall footprint proposed for this residence is 1,290 square feet. That is not your typical two family attached dwelling size. So this is not a large area. So regardless whether it's a single family dwelling or two family dwelling, they're gonna be limited in footprint to what we propose at 1,290 feet. Uh, well, our ask today, now we have other asks of stormwater committees that's outside this board, is to slide this structure forward uh, to provide additional buildable space for the street. Uh, Mr. Jerrigan, if you could approach and talk about the, uh, I think your first question, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, Michael Garrigan, Dale Associates, 516 Heather Place. Um, the building itself will be about 20 foot from the edge of the proposed pavement, but it's five feet from the public right of way. All right, so there's a, an additional 15 feet um, between the property line and, and the current yes, road. Yes, it's, it's probably closer to like 13 or 14 feet. But... Okay, so 13, so about 18 feet then? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Ms. Carpenter, if, if, I, if the board, please, I, I'll, I'll pull up the, uh, try and pull up the parcel here now to get a date on the creation of, of the lot that's here. Uh, I'll admit I don't have a great success uh, on, my, on my phone to do so here. Ms. Lamb, do you have GIS access? What are you looking for? The parcel here. That's the screenshot of parcel. Uh, Joey, I've got I've got parcel beer up and I've got the property up, but I don't know what where it tells you when to, oh, under zoning history or property history. It'd be under property history. Property history. It says date established. Oh, uh, 9 15, 1969. 
date inactive 321-2018, date established was 321-2018. And, and you will know more about what that means. Yeah, than I do. From, from that, the, the change in those dates are the date when the, the streets of the north disappeared and they're remapping. Uh, so, Ms. Carpenter, to, to your answer, it was 1969, the creation of this plot. And then, do you know? I think our other question was, do you know if there was yeah. ever a structure on that lot? I, I'm not aware of uh, one way or the other. Okay, thanks. Mr. Pepper, did you have a question? I do. Uh, Mr. Hargis, if you could pull up, you guys submitted some some site plans that were prepared by Dale and Associates with with some really helpful um, kind of color shading. And I'm looking at the one that that where you have the red arrow and uh, right above the red arrow, you have buildable area. Yes, sir. If, just, if you can tell me when you have that, that's what I wanted to ask you about. I do. I have that before me. The, the area that Mr. Pepper is discussing is an area were we to comply fully with Metro's requirements, uh, both from stormwater management and from the zoning ordinance, there's a red triangle, uh, and, and I've talked about just previously, that, that area is only 195 square feet in, in area. Uh, that is the, the, the area that without any relief from any board, this, this, this person can uh, uh, Mr. Magnus, our client, can, can construct. So as it relates to uh, Ms. Allen's discussions, uh, we want them to comply. Uh, members, I submit to you that that, that 192 square foot triangle is not buildable for uh, any house, much less a one or two family as well. Uh, uh, and, this, and so um, I appreciate that. And it, and it looks like it's 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 the, the buildable area is kind of the, the brown shading is the are the are the intended structures what's outlined there in, in black? Yes, sir. The uh, the, okay. the structure that, that's closest to Orlando uh, is the, the proposed building footprint. To the rear of that are four parking spaces. Uh, okay. That the former right of way to. to okay. Enjoy. Yeah, I see the line of the parking spaces now. So okay, I got you. Okay, thank you. That was very helpful. Yes. And that diagram is that site plan as you marked it up is very helpful. Are there any other uh, questions? Mr. Chairman, I just, I'll just add, and kind of uh, uh, tacking on to Mr. Pepper's question, uh, to, to make a statement that there is not a hardship here, this, this is the classic hardship uh, if in any case that you'll ever find. Uh, without relief from this board and others, uh, this lot is not buildable. So clearly the physical characteristics of the property as listed in, in Section A of your requirements for variance, uh, the unique situation that occurs here uh, the financial gain is not the only basis for the hardship, and there's uh, no evidence uh, been submitted or, or will be submitted that the construction on this lot uh, would in any way danger the public or adjoining property. And then the one thing I didn't, um, I, I, you may have addressed it, if you did, I didn't understand it fully, was the need for a duplex or, or two units instead of one unit, because it seems like that, uh, you know, one unit would require a smaller variance. And like I said, you may have a, be able to do it by right, but I guess I'm not, I'm still questioning how that doesn't become a, a choice. Right. Certainly uh, the owners here may be an to that, but if I, if I could a little bit, uh, the choice of the density here is not the issue that goes on with the issue. The issue exists regardless of what you build on this lot. The, the fact is that uh, doing two family dwelling in a single structure, uh, we're not in any way increasing the, the, the impact that would happen if it were a single family dwelling in a structure. So I kind of I kind of ask you to sort of take that out because that's really not an issue here is the density of it. It's clearly just the location of, of a structure on the property. But, uh, well, I guess I'm thinking about it is, you know, I don't, I don't view, you know, I view all of these requirements as constraints and you know, and you, you know, obviously, if you met all constraints, you're going to be in that little red area, which, um, to me, suggests that there's a hardship here. Um, but one of the things that you're eligible to do is to build two homes on this property, which is what you would like to do. But it sure seems to me that if you're saying that, and how if, uh, the, the examples you showed were a two and a half story maybe building, um, there's something in here that says, "Hey, these are the types of homes we're going to build," and then they're all two stories with a 
window in the attic so says well maybe there's something on that third floor maybe not so that to me implies that you're having two 1200 and some odd square foot homes and if you were to build one home that was not a 1200 square foot footprint it would require less of a front variant so it seems like you this board can allow you to build something on the lot um, based on the hardship but I, I'd like I said I just still struggling with the the fact that you want to build two is um, it, it's, it's the second home that requires that, that five foot to me Actually, uh, and, and the owner may have yeah that, so that that's what I'm struggling with so that's why I'm I'm throwing it out there for a response <laughs> so. sure, sure. But, uh, members are present the, uh, the landowner mr. Clay Magnus is, uh, is here to speak um, that's an excellent question, and uh, the, really the footprint in that footprint is the 1,290 square feet. You can have a, a really a reasonably sized one house structure, and kind of what we were doing, the inconsistency with that neighborhood, particularly a couple of, of properties that are down the street on Orlando, they're really more like townhomes. And if you were to look at them from the outside, they're, they're contiguous in their structure, and they have like two different entrances. Um, so we were thinking we could do that in consistency with the neighborhood. And obviously, from a financial standpoint, if we could sell two different structures, it would be more financially feasible for us to do that. But in, in keeping with the proposals that we made for the construction of our property, we suggested that we can either do exactly what, like the other properties that are down, like the two structured properties that are down the street in Orlando, or we could do the uh, structure that we had put in there with the uh, blueprints and it just had one door on the front, which if you look at it, you just say, well, that's just, that's just one house that's right there. Okay. Ms. Davis had uh, your hand up, I believe. Did you have a question? No, you answered my, you, you're, you restated the question I was gonna ask, so I'm fine, he answered it. All right. Trying to read your mind from afar. Any, does anybody else have a question at this point? No, Mr. Chairman, I'll save the six and a half minutes uh, for rebuttal. All right, there's six and a half minutes uh, left uh, for rebuttal, and so we will hear from uh, the opposition. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me okay on my back? I think that box with the is green is, okay. is where the... Is where the mic is? Yeah. Okay. Kathleen Murphy, uh, 231 Orlando Avenue. I am the councilwoman for this district, and so, which is why I passed it off to, uh, I asked the vice mayor to appoint an at-large member to to represent the area, because my uh, the house that I live in that my father owns is the, if you look across the street, where it says RS 7.5, uh, there's a three empty parcels um, on parcel viewer, they're not empty anymore. Uh, I'm that first house. So if you look at Parcel Viewer, you can faintly see the creek that runs behind my house, and then it runs across the top um, shaded uh, parcel across the street and onto the parcel that we are we are discussing today. And so uh, just wanted to give you all that orientation. And so obviously we've had um, a lot going on at council, so I'm gonna be a little scattered with my comments today. So I apologize for that, because I did mean to put together some pictures. Um, before I move on to some of my arguments, let me give you a little bit more lay of the land that is not shown on a pretty day when these pictures were taken. In 2010, um, uh, the flood of 2010, my backyard looked like the Mississippi River and the water went all the way to the two parcels where you see RS 7.5 crossing over into this parcel that we're discussing today. So just to give you some perspective, there are, whereas like it's not every day that we have whitewater rapids in the backyard, um, but when we have heavy storms, they come through. Metro has done some improvements and has improved the Orlando Bridge that is basically in front of my house to the I'm getting rearranged to the north of my house, um, mainly on the parcel next to mine. But what is important to point out as I'm giving you all of this kind of lay of the land is that um, is that this the, the stream buffer is not unique. 
the, the stream buffer one, zone one, and zone two are not unique to this parcel. They are also on um, the two parcels above me, and the the floodplain um, and floodway is not unique to this parcel either, because as you can see, Richland Creek at the back of this parcel uh, line, the blue is Richland Creek. So as you can see, uh, the patina development across the street from me, I believe that it says it was done as a PUD, and patina two that you see at the bottom of the page, that was done under the existing zoning of the time, and it also had the, the floodplain and the floodway. So again, the floodplain, floodway are, un, are not unique characteristics to these properties, neither are the storm buffers. So the parcel on my side of the street where it says RF 7.5 and the parcel above it are both being built right now. Um, I've had a lovely 13 years of pretending that was all my side yard. Um, great parking for parties, but now they're gonna be home built. And in fact, because of the stream buffers, they are sharing a driveway as part of uh, avoiding the stream buffer. So again, not unique characteristics here to the actual property. Um, to give you some more history of this property that we're talking about today, prior to coming into office, the former councilman was approached about combining this parcel and the one to the north of it before you get to the OL building. So just those two properties, combining them to have like a townhome development. Um, so, so it does have some other possibilities for this rather than just building on this lot alone. I was also approached shortly after getting elected in 2015, um, and in 2016, I was approached about doing townhome developments that would combine these two parcels. Um, since then, the parcel to the north of this, had, um, they were going to build um, an office building, and that is why I went. I, I supported and approved the, the right-of-way easement being abandoned by Metro. Um, and they were to share uh, a driveway was what I was told, that these two parcels would, sell it, would share a driveway. Since then, looking recently at that parcel above this, they have not, they did go to stormwater and get a variance, um, and they since have not built. So their variances from stormwater have gone away because it's been over, over a year. Um, part of the abandonment right away, uh, it, uh, part of the legislation and legislative intent that was stated on the floor was that the right of way part of the parcel could not be used for residential purposes. It could only be used for a driveway. And so uh, I think that's a, somewhat of an important history to share with that. And in fact, on the abandonment of that Lennox right of way, uh, it was also the same engineer, Michael Garrigan, who wrote the application and the application stated that uh, the reason for closure was that the road could not be constructed due to its proximity to the creek and to the floodplain floodway. And I believe that's referring to the back part of the parcel where the floodplain and floodway come into effect um, to cross over to hit another, another property that was on 45th and Sylvan Park. So giving y'all a lot of that, um, there has been mentioned of like a redesign. I have not seen that. I've only seen the original um, EZA filing, but I wanted to touch on a few other, a few other parts of, of this topic. Um, going towards the hardship, I think that I have shown y'all that the physical characteristics of this property are not unique to it. And other developers and other properties have been able to find a creative way to develop around this. There have been other options on the table for this property to be developed that have not come to fruition. Um, so, so I think when we're going down the line of section 17.4307 in the Metro Code, physical characteristics, again, while they may be not on every property, they are definitely on the majority of properties in this area. In fact, I think that um, my house may not have been able to be built currently if we are under the current standard. Uh, but, but fortunately, the flood goes north. When it rains, when, it, when the creek is full, it goes north. It does not go south towards, towards my property, thank goodness. Um, unique characteristics, again, physical characteristics, unique characteristics simply don't exist. Other properties have this. We zoomed out, you would see that as well. Um, hardships, 
not self-imposed. I think that um, the board has already discussed that a single family home could be built here. I will say that shortly coming into my term, we did down zone Orlando. I don't remember why planning left this property out and left it R6, um, but I went ahead and, and ran with it. Uh, and Councilman Bob Mendez handled that down zoning. Uh, so, so this property is something that when it was bought, uh, the property owner knew that there were stream buffers, that there was a creek. There have been signs up for many years that say stream buffer, do not disturb. And literally part of the property is not mowed because it's part of the stream buffer and should not be disturbed. Um, financial gain, not the only basis. I think very clearly the board has already discussed that the fact that this is a two family uh, uh, dwelling that they are proposing goes to why they need as much parking as they claim they need, the four parking spots. Again, not necessary if you were building a single family home and lots of uh, properties on the street park on the street. In fact, we park on the street and further up the hill on um, Orlando, uh, many properties, homeowners and renters park on the street. Same with uh, Patina. So uh, no injury to neighboring properties. I firmly believe that if this property is max, maxing out or going above what is allowed, that there is serious danger to Richland Creek, which will potentially damage um, the lots and homes in Sylvan Park, could potentially uh, affect Patina Circle and potentially back the creek up to the other side, causing it to flood where it doesn't currently flood. Um, no harm to the public welfare. Again, I, I, I'm very nervous about any more uh, structures going on this lot and what the impact on the creek would be. So again, I think that I've touched on the majority of the variance evidence that is needed to grant a variance. And it's simply, they simply don't meet enough of the requirements for this, for the requested variance. Um, also, the relief requested must relate to the hardship shown or um, that is there. So if you'll find that there is a hardship because of the creek or because of the floodway, then that the relief and the variance must relate to that. And I do not believe that street setbacks and um, and the requested variances are in connection or conjunction to to the stream buffers that they've claimed. Um, certainly, the front setback of this property is not affected because the the buffers do not go across the entire front of the property. Therefore, a front setback is not appropriate here. Um, again, the conditions are not uncom. Am I out? You're out. You're out. I'm used to it, you having my council hat and being able to continue to talk. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yep. Let me, let me, uh, Mr. Pepper, you have your hands up. I do, uh, council lady. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, are you, are you, do you still see the, um, the, it uh, looks like a, almost, it looks like this is a tax map. Uh, it's on my screen. I'm assuming it's on it's yours. On, it is. The parcel okay. yes. So, all right, and the the parcel next to this, which is RS 3.75, do you see that parcel? I do. Okay, and it looks like that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, so like 15 buildings on that parcel. Is that is that correct? If you counted them, I will trust your count. Okay. But they, they, they are they are there. I just wanted to confirm that. Yes, yeah, those are homes that was that, that was built under the PUD um, and the RS seven zoning. Okay, all right. Um, and they are all single family. There, there really are no. There are three sets of townhomes on a street of maybe twenty five. Well, I guess it's, it's a 35 homes. There are only three townhome structures. Okay. And two of which you see you see in this parcel viewer. So townhome structures are not common in this neighborhood. Okay, that's the that's only question I had. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Newton? Yes. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I did. Um, 
It looks like some of those uh, structures in that pod uh, face Orlando. Do we know what the setback is uh, on those from Orlando? So the two that face Orlando are going to be the, the bottom two in the shaded area um, that face Orlando. And I would have a hard time to guess. They are a further setback than mine is, but I can't quote exactly what their setback is. Okay. Do you know, um, I guess the only other kind of issue I'm struggling with is, you know, there the are two issues. One is the, the two family versus one. Um, I definitely see a, a, an odd situation or a different situation that's worthy of a consideration of a hardship. But I also tend to factor in that right of way, that distance from the street um, in some of these cases, which they have, you know, 13 feet. So it's an effective, you know, if they if they come and said, hey, well, I want to build something five feet from the street, you know, I, I wouldn't have considered it because I don't think that's appropriate. But because it's going to be at least, in their proposal, 18 feet from the street, I'm just curious to know if you, as a, as, because as council lady, you know what's going on on the street. Are there in any any plans of any sort out there that would uh, widen the street? And what would an appropriate setback be um, for you know a home off of the street? I mean, you know they're asking for five. Um, I could see seven to you know ten. Um, it, it, again, I, I don't know what everybody else is thinking, but I, I, what are your? Tell me your what your thoughts are on the street, and then um, uh, Ms. Davis, it looks like has a question. Sure. So again, looking at what you can see on parcel viewer right now, my house is very close to the street because the creek is behind it, and I will freely admit that my house probably does not fit modern standards of setback. So my house is the closest to the street. The two houses that are being built north of me on the R, where it says RS 7.5 on that lot and the lot ahead of it, they are building back behind the sewer easement and the two screen buffers. And so they're set back and I've got their building, um, I have their building permit and can check that, but it is. But how far are you from the street and how, how and again, I, the, the main question is, from planning, you know, uh, there are a lot of future Nashville, Nashville next. There are a lot of plans that call for different things. Is there any plan that you're aware of that would widen that street? I mean, they may put there in sidewalks. There are plans may... at this time. There is a sidewalk. So on their side of the street, the parcel that we're talking about, there is Patina has a sidewalk. So the PUD has a sidewalk. Patina Phase 2 has a sidewalk. The development um, next under Patina that you can't see has a sidewalk, and then there are about three homes and then a sidewalk. Right. So this is definitely a street where we are at the corner of, when people ask me where I live, I say the corner of White Bridge and Charlotte, where you have multiple accesses to, to public transit. This is a street that, that desperately needs the sidewalk, and the sidewalks are being built on that side okay. of the street. So, so across the street, the new homes that are being built, it looks like um, they say minimum 31.4 foot street front setback per contextual setback. Um, so clearly mine was coming right. out because mine is, mine is probably 10 feet. Um, and then the across, across, next door to this where okay, the yeah, office would go, it has a deeper setback than size. Okay, um, Ms. Davis. Um, hi, council member. I had a quick question. As you were finishing up your argument, um, I wanted to make sure I understood what you were saying. I think what you were saying is that, and I just, uh, this is sort of a question, but it's a long one. I think your argument at the end was that the hardship must be related to the variance. And in this case, the hardship of the creek and the, and the plane are not related to what they're requesting. And did I understand that correctly? Right, right. And so, so my argument is that, that the relief requested must be related to the hardship. So if they are arguing that the floodplain is in the back, which would be in their rear setback anyway, um, and can, as you can see, other properties have developed around that. Their other argument is the stream buffer, phase one and phase two, 
Um, so those are side issues. So a side setback variance um, would be an appropriate relief. Now granted, they are constrained by their property constraints, but they bought this property knowing it. And knowing when you buy a property, knowing you have these constraints, then you cannot consider that, that a hardship anymore. Um, so the smallest variance should be the variance that you consider today. And at the end of the day, I don't think they qualify for a variance because there are multiple, well, there are, there is a stream buffer here. There is a floodplain here, it's not unique. Um, the, the parking pad is for financial gain to home. Uh, the property owner mentioned that it was for financial gain. They're, they're simply, they do, they, you've got to meet all the, the care, all the reasons for a variance. And they simply don't meet all of those reasons. Okay, thank you. That was it. That was my only question. Thank you, David. I'll put my hand down. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. We will hear from uh, the applicant uh, for rebuttal. I think he had six minutes and 20 seconds, whatever Jessica puts up there. Let me find my notes. Uh, A uh, couple points let me address that council member brought up the uniqueness of this residence. Uh, th this lot is clearly unique. And if you'll go back and look at the aerial and the uh, property maps, which are on your screen now, this 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 lot is the only lot which is both encumbered by the creek itself and Richland Creek. The council member's lot is only affected by the creek itself. And the lots to the south in Patina Circle, you look at the aerial they built, at their common area on the east side of their property, they're only encumbered by the, by Richland uh, Creek. So this, this parcel is unique in that it's encumbered by both. Second, I want to clear up this, and I hear this a lot, I heard it in my tenure here before, that, that financial gain uh, disqualifies you for a variance. There's, there's no statute or case law anywhere that says a financial gain disqualifies you. The, the ordinance clearly states that financial gain cannot be the sole basis. Soul is, is also means only. Uh, clearly, any variance granted by this board or any special exception granted, there's a financial benefit to the person constructing. So I, I hope that uh, my statements are taken in the sense that uh, that's what this board does. Uh, it grants relief to allow people to make a financial gain. So, but the, your ordinance, state law, case law, all says only or sole basis. And I've clearly shown this is not the sole basis for this hardship. Uh, the council member said as far as the effect on adjoining property owners, her own statement, she said that during the storms, the rainwater flows to the north so that any construction on this lot would have zero effect on her parcel or the properties at Tina Circle. And I do want to point out one of the members asked about the setback uh, for two of the homes on Tina Circle and the uh, council member set back. Clearly, her home is legally non conforming to a 20 foot setback. Uh, if there were no home today or the home were destroyed or something were to happen to that resident, she would have to come before this board to seek a variance to reconstruct the home where she's located currently. Uh, it does not comply with the 20 foot setback. Second, I think Mr. Pepper had a question. Is, yeah, is, that, is that okay to interrupt you at this point? Absolutely. Mr. Pepper? Uh, sure. So um, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I think financial gain, I, I understand your point there, and I, and I do think this, this property is uniquely beset by hardships. But here's my question. Um, why is this not a self-imposed hardship? if the um, applicant bought this property knowing about the, the constraints? The self-imposed hardship, Mr. Pepper, un under, under Metro Zone Code of Law and PCA, the actions of the owner have to have presented the issues by which you're seeking a variance from. So there's nothing in the, in, in the ordinance, there's no actions our client did that, that created the stormwater issue or created the floodplain or any of those things. So I, I think I, I would tell you that, that whether the purchaser for value is, is looking at it, that there may be encumbered, that's what this board and the stormwater board uh, ultimately 
uh, is here for to, to determine whether there's a hardship. I submit to you members under the law, the hardship is the self-imposed angle is not, did the owner know there was something going on with the property? It's, it's, did the owner create the issue that is now bringing forth the variance? And that's clearly not the case here. It is there, is there, I don't have the, um, is there any case law, is there, is there any authority? That makes sense to me. I, I think in the past we, we may have interpreted that differently. Is there any, is any court ruled on that or is there any authority for the position that just buying the property is not what the statute is talking about when it says the applicant can't create the hardship? I, I can certainly find some, I, obviously not prepared with that answer today, but I, I, I would be stunned if there's not some case law uh, in this state that talks about uh, self-imposed hardship. But standing here, Ms. Pepper, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of why off the top of my head I could quote, quote it to you. But sure. if you look, you look at how the statute both, both Chairman, Chairman yes. Taylor. Yes, sir. This is this is Kwampu from Mitchell Legal. Uh, just, just because, Mr. Pepper, I wanted to bring this up. Um, I, I am looking at the review standards um, for variances, and this is codified at 174370. Um, and then I'm reading from number C, hardship not self imposed. And I just want to read directly from the code. Uh, again, I don't have any cases right offhand that, that have interpreted this, but what that specific section of the code states is the alleged difficulty of hardship has not been created by the previous actions of any person having an interest in the property after the effective date of the ordinance codified in this title. And I'll just read that again. The alleged difficulty of hardship has not been created by the previous actions of any person having an interest in the property after the effective, effective date of the ordinance codified in this title. Uh, thank you. And I'll, I'll remind all of our members and, and especially our new member, Mr. Newton, that uh, that Mr. Poole is available for any legal questions that we have. It's a lot more obvious uh, when we're all here in person, um, but I appreciate you uh, telling that. And if anybody has any more uh, legal questions for Mr. Poole, please uh, raise your hand. And I do see two hands up. I don't know who was first, but we'll ask uh, Mr. Newton if you have a question and then Ms. Davis. Okay. Um, I guess my question would be um, is, I, I saw that there is, the footprint shown shows um, the footprint going into the stormwater buffer, which was going to require a variance from stormwater. So regardless of whether you have the setback variance, you're still going to require a variance from stormwater for that piece of it. So I guess my question would be, what's the buildable footprint if you don't get the setback variance, but you do get the stormwater variance? Because that's going to be more than 197 square feet. I'm just kind of curious. Uh, you know what that what that is. Mr. Derrigan, is that something you could you could answer? Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Michael Garrigan, the civil engineer. Yeah. Michael Garrigan, Dillon Associates. I believe the encroachment measures around 400 square feet, so that would be 800 square feet plus or minus answer your question that would be in the zone two buffer and in that small triangle of buildable space okay so um i guess my question would be is that 800 square foot then uh i guess would that be would that be a, a you know a reasonable footprint to work within for you know for a single or two family home uh, potentially for a single but certainly not for a two family Ms. Davis, did you have a question? Or Ms. Newton, is that, did that answer your question? Yes, yeah, that answered my question. Thanks. All right, Ms. Davis. I just had a question for Mr. Hargis, and I know that he probably has some other arguments to hit, and so I don't want to throw him off. But I just, before you conclude your remarks, I wondered if you could also address whether the relief requested is too broad or expansive, um, sort of address whether the relief could be tailored to something smaller to fit what because obviously there you know this property is a difficult property and so i just wanted to know if you would address the council members argument that perhaps the relief requested it doesn't fit the problem uh, 
Uh, Ms. Davis, I, I would say to you, I mean, there's still, there's still, should we be successful today? The, the stormwater committee is going to have to weigh in on the construction toward the interior of the lot, if that makes sense. Um, in that it, it's nothing that, that the client would be violating under the zoning code uh, as far as to build toward the center of the property. Uh, but stormwater is going to have some effect on on uh, where or how much encroachment that can occur. So I'm really, I'm not sure I can answer that question uh, as, as it relates to, to the, the council members because there, there is still another entity uh, at play here. No, that's fair. I appreciate it. Thank you. And, and I'd like to address uh, something that, that your legal counsel, Mr. Poole, brought up. Uh, the key part there to understand is that there's, there's no actions by this owner or prior owner that instituted the stormwater regulations that kicked in a buffer that requires this buildable footprint that leaves the, the sort of rust covered triangle that leaves us to work with. Again, this is Metro's actions that instituted, and, and rightfully so after the 2010 flood. That, that, that sort of eat up this property. If, if you did not have the floodway buffers uh, that are here, again, I'm not advocating that we get rid of those, but clearly my client has a much more buildable area to work with. Uh, so it's not any action upon which he's done to himself so as to address the self imposed hardship question. Ms. Davis, did you have another question? No, nope, I just didn't put my hand down. I'll put it down. <laughs> Let me also add, too, and I'm kind of getting back into my time on a rebuttal. Uh, the council member talked about folks parking on the street. That is not permitted under Metro Code for new construction at all. The zoning code in 1720, forget the numbers now, they leave me, 030 or 40. Uh, the parking requirements for one and two family dwellings are two parking spaces per dwelling unit. They have to be on the property. They cannot be out of the street. The zoning code does not permit parking on the street to be counted toward required parking and zoning ordinance. So in our site plan, we're showing four spaces as required. I'm saying to you members that, that two spaces versus four spaces is not the issue that's affecting there. Because if you look at our site plan, there's still a 20, there's there's still a 20 foot sewer easement that runs through this parking. Parking is permitted to be in a sewer easement, uh, however structures are not. And really kind of boil it down Members, what, what we're trying to get to is, is to allow this this, uh, this owner to build a residence with a setback that's somewhat equal to what the council lady enjoys today and the two homes down at the corner of the Tina Circle. Uh, when you look at, and, and you certainly look at the uh, uh, the ground shots of that area, those, those that Patina Circle development is a PUD, so their setbacks are, are quite a bit reduced. They're clearly not 20 feet. But again, they, they did not have to be. Uh, but members, that's really all I've got to, uh, to add. Again, we, we meet all the requirements under the uh, zoning ordinance, both state law and metro, for the, the reason for hardship. There's the physical characteristics of the property, the uniqueness of this property being affected by both Richard Fleet and the stream that's on the property, that no other lot out here is, is affected by both of those items. Again, uh, the financial gain is not the sole basis for them. Uh, the, the hardship of nine post And with that, I'll... Uh, okay, are there any other questions for the applicant? Uh, seeing none and you have nothing else to add? All right, we'll close the public hearing and I'll ask uh, members for discussion and thoughts. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Lawless. I'll make a motion that we deny. There's a motion to uh, deny the variance. Is there a second? Ms. Karpenick? I'll second. There's a motion and a second. Um, is there any discussion? The, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Newton. Um, the the only discussion I, I would the only argument that I would that I see is valid is that that there is a kind of a contextual setback along the street there, but um, but obviously that that was set by a PUD and not by this, this individual lot. So I, 
I'll take that back. Never mind. Well, you know, I, I look at it too as I mean, I do see, it, I do see the lot as um, hardship worthy. Um, I still struggle with the the need for a five foot setback versus you know a ten foot setback um, as as related to uh, the the choice of two units versus one. Um, and, and I do think that. Um, I would be willing to consider a variance uh, as long as the, you know, the buildings were at least 20 feet from the street, which I think is achievable. Um, but again, that's that's my comment on the motion. Uh, but uh, Mr. Pepper, did you have a comment on the discussion or discussion on the motion? Uh, I did. The I think that looking at this site plan and the the buildable area. Um, and I think there are a lot of hardships with this property. I, I think what the applicant is proposing is is reasonable. I, it seems to me like a 12 around a 1,200 square foot buildable footprint is just not that much of a footprint um, on this, particularly considering this piece of property. And I would, you know, if. So I think what they're proposing is reasonable. If if other members felt like the the applicant said that they could build, that it was reasonable to try to build with an 800 square foot footprint, I would be willing to consider something like that. Okay. There's we do have a motion and a second on the the table, and so um, Mr. Poole. Let me. Sorry, I forgot I need to unmute myself. I know the motion that's currently on the table is one uh, simply to deny. It may be uh, maybe prudent to add some sort of uh, basis um, to the motion, whether it be you don't find that there's a hardship or do you find that the hardship is self-imposed, whether it be you find that the hardship, or excuse me, the variance requested is not related to uh, the hardship that has been found, if there is one to be found. Um, I just have a little bit of concern with it just being, I, I move, move to deny the variance. Okay, Mr. Wallace? Make me, I'll moder modify it to it's self-imposed. Uh, Ms. Karpenick, are, is that acceptable to you as the, to second that motion or did you have, you raised your hand and look like you yeah. You look like you were thinking electronically. Right, you know me too well. <laughs> um, yeah, I was more along the lines of um, there's a buildable footprint there without the the 20 foot um, or the 15 foot variance. I was more along those lines than the self-imposed lines. So I don't know what that does to the motion. <laughs> I, I, I'll withdraw my modification to it and go with uh, Christina's. Great. Okay, so that, We're on so the, the same page. The, so you keep that second, Christina? Sure. All right. Yes. So there's a motion that, that with the stormwater variance, there would be a buildable footprint, uh, and therefore the hardship is not there. It's been seconded. Um, is there any other discussion on this motion? If not, then uh, we'll call the question. And uh, if you, uh, the yes vote is in favor of denying uh, the variance. And I'll start with Mr. Lawless. Yes. Uh, Mr. Pepper? No. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Karpenick? Uh, in favor. Uh, Ms. Davis? In favor. And I'll vote no, and so that motion passes four to two. All right. The uh, next case is, I believe, 96. Is that right? That's right. All right. The next case is 96, and I'm going to uh, turn that case over to uh, our Vice Chair, Mr. Pepper, and recuse myself for Ms. Kate. Ms. Carpenter, did you have a question? I don't have a question. I just had a statement to make. Okay. Now. 
Um, I just wanted to point out that my um, firm leases an office space at 1625 Broadway, which is the Orbison building. This is um, down the road from this proposed development. Um, I reviewed the shadow study and found that um, the proposed development does not affect the Orbison building. Um, I would like to say that I drove by, uh, I went to my office three times since the last BZA meeting, and I drove on Broadway, 15th, and Church, and I did not see any uh, BZA appeal signs present. Yeah. Uh, well, so I, I will, and I'll just say, I, I, uh, my, my work is within uh, a close enough proximity to uh, this project uh, it, that's the basis of the recusal, and there have been signs there for months. So, I mean, they were, uh, they may have been taken up uh, after the last meeting when it got deferred, but they have been up mm -hmm. for for months. Okay, so you have seen signs on church? Oh, absolutely. Or? Yeah, absolutely. There were there were signs on church, there were signs on Hayes. Uh, I, I don't remember a sign on Broadway, but there were so many signs on Hayes and church and mm -hmm. 16th and 15th. I mean, that... I mean, frankly, and, and I don't know if it's because of the number of parcels that uh, are in question, it, it seems like there was a sign on every parcel. I mean, I, um, and again, just, just having, I work within that block, so I just am familiar with it. And so that's, um, and, 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 you know, again, I, 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 I don't want to state too much because I'm recusing myself, but there's, there's enough, um, there's enough, um, communication from neighbors and communication from other folks. And then all I'm doing is just testifying to you that uh, as someone who works close to that spot, there were plenty mm -hmm. of signs. Okay. Well, I, you know, from the last BZA meeting until um, Monday, I drove by three times and I did not see the signs. So perhaps um, the applicant can address that. Sure. When they um, I, I, will, I will turn that over to Mr. Pepper and let him address that question, and I'm, I will excuse myself and see you all and shortly. Mr. Pepper. Okay. Uh, is the applicant ready? Uh, they are here, so I'll uh, go ahead okay. and give you all the quick board presentation uh, about staff. Before you is, um, this is case 2020-096, involving property at 1525 Church Street, 112 and 116 16th Avenue North. 1500, 1502, 1504, 1506, 1511, 1512, 1516, 1518, and 1530 Broadway, 1500-1502, 1508-1509, 1511-1512, 1514-1515, 1516-1518, 1519-1520, 1521-1523 Hay Street, this is a request for a special exception from the height at the setback and within the slope control plane to construct a mixed use development. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning as CF. And I would point out that the parcel viewer, the red parcel that is highlighted is only one portion. Um, all of the parcels at issue are what go down across up and that back black outline is the section at issue here. Uh, this is the aerial photography showing you the property and surrounding areas. This is the site plan that was submitted by the applicant. And finally, the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to this case? Seeing no opposition, the applicant uh, can address the board now. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Thank you. Um, I'm Kim Hawkins with Hawkins Partners, landscape architects and planners representing the owner. And while we understand there is no one in opposition, we do request additional time due to the attention on this case, if we may ask that first. Sure. Uh, Ms. Hawkins, or so you're, you're asking for a continuance, essentially? No, more time, no, more time to address oh, the board right now. Okay, sure. I'm sorry. I miss, how much more time would you like? If we could have the full 10 minutes as opposed to five. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion that the applicant be... Uh, allowed a full 10 minutes as opposed to five minutes to present their case. Is there a second? I'll second. This is Ashanti Davis. Okay, Ms. Davis has seconded it. So uh, we'll take a roll call vote on that. Uh, I vote in favor. Ms. Davis, how do you vote? In favor. Ms. Carbonek? In favor. 
Mr. Newton. Favor. And Mr. Lawless. I'm going to vote against it. Okay. So that that uh, motion carries. So Ms. Hawkins, you'll have 10 minutes. Thank you. I'm first going to address the signs. Uh, there was a sign exhibit that was uh, sent to DBA staff with the 321 is when they were uh, posted. And the sign exhibit, all of the signs and photographs of all of them uh, placed on the site was sent to BZA staff. I'm now going to ask Ann Walker Harrison, who represents uh, the owner, to uh, address the board. Thank you, Ann Walker Harrison, 1512 Broadway. Uh, members of the board, good afternoon. Thank you for having us here today. I'm Ann Walker Harrison, daughter of Celeste Reed and a fourth generation member of the Reed family, and I've been asked to speak on our behalf today. My great great grandfather, Jim Reed, started his auto repair shop on Broadway in 1914. By 1930, he gained a franchise agreement with General Motors, and as our family history has it, he learned of this only upon receiving a call from Union Station informing him that a container of Chevrolet had arrived with his name on it. For the next 40, 80 years, excuse me, my family operated Jim Reed Chevrolet on Broadway. Today, we are before you to discuss the future of this site. Like all Nashvilleians, my family and I have watched our city dramatically change over the last decade. For five years now, we have thoughtfully considered how we might impact the future of Nashville with our property. After evaluating many qualified candidates, we ultimately selected Heinz to undertake this development. Heinz's global reputation speaks for itself, but it was their commitment to help us craft the lasting family legacy in Nashville that made them the right choice. We are not real estate developers. We are a family, and we care deeply that our city continue to be a place where we are proud to live. Our goal is to leave a legacy and contribute to our community and Heinz is the right real estate firm to help us deliver on that promise. With this future in mind, we ask that you approve the special exception request that we are asking for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this request to approve the special exception is for all parcels noted and for the reasons outlined in the letter and exhibit submitted by our legal counsel dated April 15th and supplemented on May the 6th, which you've received, and we ask to be entered into record and conditioned as outlined by our council for an agreement with probe. This site includes the historic Coke building at 16th and Church, deemed worthy of conservation and built in 1928, which will be adaptively reused as a feature of the development. These properties have had as their current CF four frame zoning since 1974, so over 46 years and will be developed under all of the rules and regulations of that current zoning, including the allowed land uses and bulk regulations, with the only exceptions being maximum height at setback and penetrating the height control plane, both of which are allowed as special exceptions per Metro Code 1712-060-F building height control. Note that all of the surrounding properties have the identical bulk regulations of this site under the CS zoning, an FAR of five and an ISR of one. That includes the MUIA parcels, the other CS parcels, and the immediately adjacent SP parcel of Broad West. Metro planning staff noted in their recommendations letter of approval that CS zoning does not stipulate a maximum height or story that in this district height is regulated by the FAR allowance, and that CS is an older zoning form that creates irregular and inefficient floor plans. More desirable is a maximum height of the build two zone, similar to other so-called A districts in the updated code, creating floors of the same size. Additionally, they noted the site plan and massing indicated is consistent with the current Metro planning midtown special policy. So that required, we voluntarily provided maximum height designations and stories on the site plan from 326 to 400 feet, 32 to 39 stories on block B and C, and a maximum of 19 stories on the north portion of the site, block A, to provide more certainty and to be consistent as noted in the Midtown Special Policy. The height noted will include a condition of an additional height restriction at 16th and Broadway, done in agreement with the adjacent Broadway, Broad West developer. 
We're especially pleased to now announce that we have the support and confidence of a number of our adjacent property owners and our council person, Freddie O'Connell, with no parties in opposition. We've provided Exhibit F, page 133 of your board packet, a sun angle study that shows the arrangement of the building massing and void spaces within the site, indicating the lack of negative impact on light, air, and wind for this property, the adjacent public street, and the adjoining properties. We also provided Exhibit H, that's pages 196 and 197 in your board packet, the slope control diagram, which shows the allowable volume of space which can be built by right under the current CF zoning within the slope control plane. That is shown in a dark blue pyramid in that exhibit. And in light blue, it shows the shifting of the building massing out of the slope control plane toward the setback line, as Lee noted. Note that the proposed total volume allowed under the BZA special exception request is two-thirds of the volume that is allowed under the current CF zoning. So we are 33% below what would be allowed under current zoning with the slope control plan. Um, as proposed, the site includes community benefits, including all required infrastructure improvement, a reconnection of the fabric of Midtown to downtown through a walkable and enhanced streetscape with active uses and storefronts. We have exceeded the required major collector and street plan for sidewalk width and frontage zone, and notably, we're maintaining the historic Coke building as an integral part of the development. And now I turn over to our uh, legal Good afternoon, James Weaver, Waller, and Lanston, 511 Union Street. Um, as noted, this is a special exception um, uh, for you today. We, we have information in the record that we believe satisfies each and every element of the special exception, and we would ask it be approved uh, pursuant to our application and our amendment to the application. We also would ask that the approval be conditioned upon our agreement with, uh, with our, our uh, uh, neighbor, the post uh, folks, and Mr. Brown is here who can address the board uh, about that. We have provided the zoning administrator with the language for the uh, condition to the uh, to the approval. I won't uh, take up my of uh, your time reading them. I think uh, the zoning administrator can provide those to you guys. We're happy to answer questions about them, but they reflect uh, agreements on, with regard to uh, setback and height in a couple of places on the development site. And again, have reflect our um, agreement and understanding uh, with our uh, with our neighbor. Uh, this proposal is supported now by all of the contiguous contiguous neighbors to the site, our council member, the planning department. Uh, we appreciate uh, all you guys do um, for our city, and we would ask that it be approved as conditions. And I've reserved the last two minutes to put or minute fifty five. Uh, again, uh, Mr. Brown is here. And if that would be, I feel like I'm trying to look at the chairman, but I'm just looking at his empty chair. It would be all right with that we could pass it in this case if he could address the, the uh, board also. Is, is he presenting for your side, Mr. Weaver? Or is I'm he? Correct. I'm for there, or, That's what he's doing. Yes, sir. Okay, that's fine. If you've got time left, that's fine. Uh, my name is Chris Brown. I live at 2401 Chestnut Road in. In Alabama. Um, good afternoon. I am the president and primary principal of Pope's Development, which is the sponsor and developer of the Broad West project, which is immediately west of the applicant site. And we've been working feverishly with the Heinz Group um, to understand their application and to uh, express a few concerns. And I'm happy to report that we've reached an agreement. Subject to the concessions that Mr. Weaver represented, we are in favor of the board approving the applicant's request. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Brown, you were you were you're with the company that formally opposed the opposed the applicant, but y'all worked it out essentially based yes, on sir. some conditions. Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Are they are they uh, just for because we're doing this by phone? Are they lengthy 
I just want to, if we do vote to approve this with these conditions, I just want to make sure we get them into the record adequately, and I don't know the best way to do that. Mr. Chair, Vice Chairman, this is John Michael, Zoning Administrator. I've uh, got a written copy of those agreements. They are not terribly lengthy, and I think it would probably be in our best interest to read those into the record so that they are formally a part of the record in the very unlikely event of any sort of legal appeal. With your permission, I go ahead and read the three conditions into the record. Yes, please. The written document reads as follows in the email that I received earlier this afternoon. Setback. Applicant conforms to three sections on 16th Avenue North from Broadway to Hayes and on Broadway from 16th Avenue North to 15th Avenue North per attached diagram. Height. On corner of Broadway and 16th Avenue North, limit height of any structures to 326 feet for a distance of 100 feet east of 16th Avenue North setback line. Limit height of any structures to 326 feet for a distance of 150 feet north of Broadway setback line. For any structures further north of 150 feet from Broadway fronting 16th Avenue North, height will be limited to 400 feet for a distance of 100 feet east of 16th Avenue North setback line until Hayes Street. Above grade parking. Along 16th Avenue North, frontage for a total distance of 150 feet extending north from the Broadway setback line the maximum height of any above grade parking facing 16th Avenue North may not exceed 574 feet mean elevation above sea level or 65 feet from spot elevation of 509 feet at corner of 16th Avenue North and Broadway. Such above grade parking along 16th Avenue North may extend above 574 feet mean sea level elevation so long as an occupiable space liner screening, such as parking, is built. Mr. Vice Chairman, I'm confident you committed that to memory as I read it to you, and I appreciate <laughs> you having done so. This written document is uh, now technically submitted as part of the board record and having been read in as part of what the board's considering in today's case. Please let me know if you have any questions, as I'll be happy to answer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, so is is... Uh, is the applicant done with its presentation? One second, Mr. Pepper, they're discussing. Okay. Yeah. The, the, uh, I'm going to turn me back on. This is James Weaver again. Mr. Chairman, the only thing I would just add is that the conditions add detail to the, the application and the amended application contain a number of, of uh, particularly as it regards height, and, that and, and um, those are still part of the application. We're asking you to approve those just as amended or changed or providing additional detail, if you will, on some of those as, as, the, as, as from the condition. This would be so much easier if everybody was there. So you approve Yeah, so, so that I make sure, so that I'm sure that I understand it. Um, the, the special exception would be granted with the conditions that were just read into the record, correct? That's, that's correct, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're done. Um, okay. All right. Discussion? Board members? Um, Ms. Karpinek, do you have your hand up? I do, um, and thank you for, um, I should thank Chairman Taylor for explaining the signs. Um, I did not receive this sign exhibit, so, but we do have about, I don't know, 50 bookmarks on our board packet for this um, case, so it's very well I could have missed that. Um, so my question is about the shadow study, and I don't know if that's something that can be on the screen. Um, when you were reading off the uh, page numbers, they don't quite correspond with, um, I don't know if it corresponds with exactly what we have in our in our board packet. Um, what is it you want? It is page the shadow study. 133. 133. Yeah, okay, that does correspond with what's in our packet. Possibly beginning at page 130. Um, yeah, what I'm looking at is 133 in the PDF for our board. Exhibit F, Ms. Carpenter. Yeah, no, I, I have it here. I didn't know if it could be called up on the screen. Oh, uh, I don't think I can access that. It would uh, technologically be difficult. 
and thus okay. sharing my presentation with you. Understood, understood. Um, so my questions are about, I mean, there are some days throughout the year where there are pretty deep shadows on the streets, like for example, Hay Street um, and 15th and somewhat on Broadway a little bit. Um, so can you address that? And because you all said that there were, from what I understood, um, that there weren't any issues with, with, um, with shadows. The document that you have shows sun angle shown at different times of the day and different times of the year. So we've tried to show um, a full range from spring, summer, fall, winter, so that you're, you're getting the entire year. Uh, what mm -hmm. we have done is there are a lot of open spaces within the, um, the site. And so part of what you're seeing is certainly at very early in the morning, very late in the afternoon, in the winter especially, you will see more a shadow as you will kind of throughout the city. And so what this is, is showing is there's not a specific area that is constantly in shadow, that it changes based on time of day, time of the year, and those open spaces that are provided between those building massings um, provide that idea of light and air which comes into this site onto those adjacent um, parcels and the adjacent um, and the adjacent streets, the public streets. I don't know if that helps explain all of those diagrams, but that's what mm -hmm. you're doing. Yeah. yeah, I can, I understand the diagrams, um, but there is some impact. There are some times of the day um, and year um, where there will be deep shadows on those streets. Yeah, I would not argue that there are times of the day or times of the year where there would be shadows on the streets. I would not argue with that. But as a joke, okay. yeah. Yeah, thank you. So this is uh, Mr. Pepper. I had, when there was opposition, um, and, and by the way, before I get, I kind of goofed up, before we have a board discussion, do, do any board members have questions of the applicant or of Mr. Brown who, who also uh, appeared before we discuss it amongst ourselves? Okay, so, um, Let's discuss it among ourselves. The um, so, Ms. Karpinek, back to your point about the light and shadow study. My concern was with when there was opposition to this. My concern with that study was it did seem to to show that there were a lot of shadows. But I'm and, and I was I was also concerned because I didn't know how you could have an accurate light and shadow study when you didn't know the exact height of your buildings. But the, um, I'm, I view this as that if, if the opposition who is adjacent to this property um, and is, is okay with the, with the height of the buildings and, and there's been an agreement now limiting, limiting the structures, then that I'm okay with it. And also there were a lot of adjoining nearby property owners that um, supported the, the application to begin with. So that I, I had the same concerns you had when I saw that light and shadow study, but um, I, I, my, my opinion on that is that if, if Probst Development is, believes that they've reached a suitable agreement as to the conditions, then then that's fine with me. I think that's, that tells me that there is no uh, adverse impact that would warrant us not granting the special exception. But others may disagree, so um, anybody else? Uh, Mr. Lawless. I was just going to make a motion that we approve the special exception since we've sort of talked it through several times. Okay. Uh, and I will, uh, is there a second for that? Anyone? Hello? This is Logan Newton. I'll second it. Uh, okay. So we have a motion. Thank you, Logan. Okay, we have a, Mr. Lawless has made a motion to approve the special exception. 
Uh, Mr. Lawless, is that an approval with the conditions that were read into the record? Yes, it is. I thought that was part of the the entire now proposal put before us as amended by those additional matters that were read in. Okay, you may be correct about that. I just wanted to make make sure that we were clear on that. So, okay, and, and there's a second to that motion. So we'll take a roll call vote. Um, Ms. Davis, how do you vote? Is there, no, Chairman, um, Chairman Pepper, I guess we, before we move to the vote, we just wanna make sure there's no discussion on the motion. Okay, I'm sorry, you're correct. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Okay, I don't see anybody's hand raised, so I will, we will uh, go to the roll call, roll call vote on the motion. Ms. Davis, how do you vote? I vote in favor. Okay. Ms. Karpinek, how do you vote? Uh, in favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. And this is Mr. Pepper, I vote in favor. So that motion carries. Okay, um, before we, um, I turn the gavel back over to Mr. Taylor, um, why don't we take a 10 minute break with that work? <laughs> Mr. Taylor's had his 10 minute break, so I wanna make sure we get one before he gets back. 10 minutes it is. Okay, 10 minutes. <laughs> Present. Also present. Keaton. I'm here. Uh, Mr. Pepper. Here. And Mr. Lawless. Here. All right. Uh, we have uh, all board members present. We'll reconvene and call the meeting back to order and hear the next case. Next case is case 2020-106 involving property at 6 Peach Blossom Square. Request for variance from rear setback requirements to construct a rear addition for a single family residence. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property R8. Uh, area of photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. And finally, the site plan submitted by the applicant and the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 106? Seeing none, the applicant will have five minutes. Please be sure to identify yourself. Good afternoon. My name is Laws Nelson from Ferris Concepts and Architecture. I'm representing a client that's in the sixth Peach Block. Uh, our client currently lives in Green Hills and has been looking for a place to retire and downsize the town of property on the Peach Blossom, and they're requesting a variance from the rear setback, similar to the adjacent structures, in order to build a one story addition. Uh, the addition would be a master bedroom with a screened in porch uh, and master bathroom. And since all the current bedrooms in the property are on the second floor, they're looking for this variance in order to build that master bedroom on the first floor to avoid uh, going up and down stairs on a, on a daily basis. Even with the addition of master suite and the screened in porch, we still are below the allowable lot coverage square footage number. And uh, we have to even the height of the With that, Happy to answer any questions the board might have. Did you, uh, I guess there was a little confusion in the application that talked about a, a, an abandoned easement or something that I didn't 
quite understand, but I, and, I, and I do see that, that your addition is, uh, if not in line, actually closer, uh, further away from the property line than some of your neighbors. That uh, neighbor has been there for a long time. Uh, did, did, did you have any uh, communication with the neighbor that adjacent that you're touching? On the left and the right? Well, I guess it would be uh, on top. The, okay. I'm looking at the, the one on... Um, on Craighead? Yeah, the, the one that, that touches your rear setback. Our office did not personally have any contact. Uh, our client was responsible for both sign placement and uh, coordinating all letters that went to the coast department. We have not heard anything back from them about whether they did or didn't, or if they've heard anything from the surrounding neighbors about the opposite. But it is a it is a one story addition, which seems in line with the other uh, structures that are on the property line. Right. Is that what you said? Are there any questions from the board at this point? Um, is uh, hey, Mr. Nelson, uh, is there a uh, a wall on the back side of the property as it is existing? There is. Uh, there's a brick privacy wall towards the rear of the property uh, that spans both property, both side property lines of our lot, and I do not know if it extends to the adjacent property. Uh, follow up to that would be: Do you know how how tall that is, and how how far your addition is going to be from that? I do not know how tall the wall is currently, but our addition it is set pretty much on the property line, and our addition is going to be three feet away. Um, we will not be affecting that. Wall. So uh, I want to ask the question I ask a lot. It's, what is the hardship with the lot that justifies the variant? Hardship with the lot would be the shared driveway between uh, site six and four. We have, uh, without having additional setback space on that right-hand side to have this addition kind of curve into a U shape like the two adjacent properties, the detached garage, and number four with the attached garage kind of requires us to go back further than it would be if perhaps the driver wasn't being shared by the neighbor. Okay, and I see this, is that a poured concrete driveway? I'm looking at the, the picture that's up now. Is that, that's a- uh, Yes, it is. It is the is uh, it? property to the right has a uh, garage in the back that has the garage door spacing into that concrete pad in the rear. And is that driveway on both property, both properties? It is. The property line runs pretty much right down the center of the property. Okay. Okay, and you're you're saying that keeps that that keeps your client from building to the side essentially is that yes sir the, that, that that hems you in on that side okay thanks any other questions Ms. Wallace just so that I will be totally sure this is to accommodate a, a, an owner that is advancing in years, shall we say? Yes, the term I believe would be aging in place. Okay, thank you. Are there any other, any other questions from the board? All right, did you have anything else to add? I don't believe so. Okay, uh, with no other questions, uh, I'll close the public hearing. Any thoughts? Ms. Carpenter. Uh, well, first.
first of all, um, it's hard to hear you, Chairman Taylor, and also the um, applicant. I did make out what you all said, but I'm not sure um, why you all sound so distant. Um, I do hear the other board members pretty well. Um, but onto the case, um, to me, this was like a rear setback that was acting as a side setback, if that makes sense. Um, the way this lot and all the lots next to it are oriented to the side of the home, of the neighboring home, um, I guess, plan north. Um, there's no north arrow on this. Um, so to me, I was willing to entertain maybe a five foot. Um, they requested three and I would propose um, a five foot um, setback just to be in line with what um, we would normally see for this type of zoning would be a side setback of five feet. So I was wondering if anyone else would um, care to share their thoughts. Uh, Ms. Davis? I was just gonna say that I agree with Ms. Kaepernick. Um, it seemed like a variance would be workable <laughs> in this case, but I would be more in line to support a five foot variance for the reason she stated than the three foot. Uh, it, it, unless Ms. Davis is actually seconding what I'm assuming is Christina's motion, then I will second Christina's motion. <laughs> <laughs> I will make that into a motion. Thank you. <laughs> There's a motion and a second. And I would like to ask if, if anyone has objections to asking the applicant uh, the impact of the project for five versus three, if that is acceptable. Does any, if you object, just put your, raise your hand button. If not, then I'll open it up to ask the applicant that question. Okay, I don't see any objection. So if the applicant, the, the, the motion uh, proposal is for a five foot setback instead of three, is that workable for you? This is still in a very schematic phase, so I don't see any reason why that Okay. Are there any other questions since we opened the um, hearing again, Ms. Wallace? Actually, it's, I'm going to ask you, Chairman Taylor, can you maybe move a little bit closer to your telephone or move your speaker closer? I'm kind of having a hard time hearing you, too. Can you hear me better now? No, not really. I'm talking right into, I've got this thing right, this little wireless thing that I'm, I'm actually down at the Sunny, and so they, uh, the technical folks are trying to help me out, but I'm, I'm talking right into this thing, and I may have to move down. Can you, Am I still, still? That'll work. I'll make it work. I'll raise the volume on mine. Don't worry about it. Well, what the, the proposal out there is, uh, I don't know if you heard the applicant. The applicant said that it was in the schematic phase and they didn't uh, have a, an issue with the five uh, foot variance. And so there is a motion on the floor from Mr. Lawless. Uh, it's just seconded, I believe, by Ms. Karpenek. Is there any other discussion on that motion? Uh, seeing none, then I'll call the question and ask for a vote, and we'll ask uh, Mr. Lawless. Aye. Ms. Carpenter? Uh, in favor. Ms. Davis? In favor. Ms. Ne uh, Mr. Newman? In favor. And Mr. Pepper? In favor. And I'll vote for that, too, so that motion passes with this uh, top of area. Thank you. And I, I now have a new wireless mic, so hopefully that's better. Much better. Right. Substantially <laughs> better. Board members, can you all hear me? This is Emily. I'm coming. Barely. Well, that's the benefit of being the chairman. They take away the uh, the secretary's mic. <laughs> can you hear me now? Guilty. We have to deport it around here. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Talk to you. Yeah, that's better. All right. Next case for the board. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, one thing, um, Chairman Taylor, you had said at the very end there um, was a five foot variance. It was a five foot setback. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, five foot setback. That's right. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah, so, yeah uh, yes. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the variance was, but the setback would have been five feet. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. 
Next case for the board to consider is case 2020-113 involving property at 1802 Warfield Drive. This is a request for variances from uh, minimum lot size and front setback requirements to construct a two-family dwelling. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to this case? No opposition here. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property is R10. This is the aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Site plan submitted by the applicant. And finally, the current conditions of the property. Before the applicant makes his case, I would like to read an email that I received from the council member um, this afternoon. I'd like to read it into the board record, into the record for the board. It says, commissioners, I'm writing today concerning BZA's case number 2020-113, requested variance from minimum lot size and front setbacks at 1802 Warfield Drive in District 25. The applicant, Jason Cleave, reached out to me very early in the process and has kept me updated with his plans. I have heard from two neighbors who oppose this request. Both live and own property in the 1800 block of Warfield Drive. The applicant is requesting to deviate from established rules in order to construct two homes on this parcel. I have informed you of the opposition I have received. I will leave it to the discretion of the BZA to evaluate the existence of a hardship on the part of the applicant and respect the decision at which you arrive. Thank you so much for your dedicated service to our city. You are much appreciated. Russ Pulley, Metro Council District 25. That being read the opposition and to the record and no opposition present, the applicant will now have five minutes. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Jason Cleave, 1802 Warfield Drive. Um, me and my mom purchased this property together. Um, she's getting uh, older and uh, needs a one level home and basically needs my assistance as well. Um, unfortunately, living with my mother is not really an option. I need space as well. Um, so that's why I'm proposing this. Um, the setback, as for the setback, the reason I'm asking for the setback variance is that the neighboring house is 28.4, which is what their setback is on Warfield Drive as well. And then the reason for the building envelope is going to be because of how the lot is and how it's structured. I don't have enough depth basically to put two homes on it. Well, it, it, it looked like on the, um, and, and the, the map that's up, up on the screen now is a little bit more helpful in terms of knowing uh, context for the neighborhood in terms of two, two family homes on it. But, you know, you, you certainly are, are really close, 2% uh, off. And I think what was initially submitted uh, to me uh, it was frankly almost impossible to tell how your lot compared to other folks. And, and I'm not saying that was your responsibility. Um, but just kind of in general, my rule of thumb for putting any kind of lot size variance on a, on a consent agenda, again, yours is uh, 78 feet off uh, the minimum requirement. You know, it really is a contextual thing for me and others on the board uh, have different feelings about it. Uh, but that, that tends to be how I look at it. And so it does look like that you have, uh, there are, are plenty of other lots that are uh, multi or two family eligible based on what's actually been built on them uh, uh, close by. And part of the concern I had was the, uh, you, were, you were only 2% off, but it, it seemed like it was because you're, lot looks like Oklahoma, you know? Yeah, yeah um, right. And that was why I really wanted to make sure I understood the context context of the neighborhood because if you just had an odd shaped lot and every, nobody else could have this, then, then those are things that I tend to not support. So uh, I, I appreciate you clarifying that. Um, Mr. Newton had a question, so. Yes, uh, I just wanted to actually kind of clarify and, and, and ask uh, the owner to confirm this, but because um, I grew up blocks from here so i know the site well um so that, that that back you mentioned from warfield the adjacent house i just want to clarify it that is a side setback is that correct no i don't I, it's not it's 1800 warfield it's not a side setback 
Does that does that uh, house face low note, or does it face more towards? It's it's it, it sits on the corner of it. It doesn't face technically either one. There's a driveway on both sides. So Lone Oak and Warfield does a driveway that connects into both. Okay, and I'm just want to clarify. There's two. There's two different things at question here. There is the lot size, which I think that's totally understandable. Then there's the setback, which is uh, there's two different issues. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. And we and, and the the structures as well on the setback. On the setback, they are going to have garages as well, and it will be a U shape because I will be owning the property personally because my mother and me will be living on it. So it's really not that far off of what I'm asking. What everyone else has in there, I mean, it lines up structurally. It looks right. And the home's going to be consistent with everything else in the two build structures as well. Does that answer your question, Ms. Newton? Yes, it did. Okay. Are there any, any other questions at this point? Okay, did you have... More to add? Not really, other than, I mean, I've been in that area since 1979, and uh, I'm just coming back just to kind of help her out a little bit, and uh, she doesn't want to leave the area, so we've, just, we've been there a long time. So. That's it. That's okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no other questions from the board? All right, we'll close the public hearing and uh, discussion. And, and uh, Mr. Union, you're, right, you're correct. I think there, there, someone mentioned that there you know, were two issues, the uh, front setback and the lot size, and it's perfectly appropriate, and we often uh, approach these as separate questions. So if you feel uh, strongly about one or the other, uh, we certainly can address those you know, as two motions. Ms. Karpinek? Um, yes, um, I was looking at um, this is their site plan. Well, the existing how the existing um, house sits on their site, and what I'm reading is it's a 38.9 foot setback, and I think it might be appropriate to allow them um, to have that same setback that they have now. So I would be in favor of. Um, of having that setback, granting them that setback instead of the 28.4 um, foot setback. Okay. Are there other, other thoughts on that? And is that something that it, at some point we can ask? Uh, that, I'm sorry, Ms. Davis? Um, I was just going to say that uh, I agree with Christine, I would prefer the setback not give them any more than what they currently have. And I'm also willing to support the lot size variance giving the minimal amount, but it is short. And in light of the context of the surrounding area. Okay. Mr. Newton? Yeah, uh, I would agree on the lot size. I don't have any issue there. Um, but yeah, I, I think at most, as I, I'd say I would support getting it, giving it to where the current house is um, where it looks like the current house kind of juts out, so maybe even, you know, because uh, it's two different dwellings, you know, I'd, I'd really like to see them kind of step back with, uh, you know, back towards that neighboring lot, but I don't think that that's an option uh, to separate the two dwellings. So, yeah, I, I would support that. Okay, Mr. Pepper? Uh, so uh, I'm really on the fence here because I think Ms. Karpinek makes a, a good point about keeping the, the setback where it is. But if, as I look at this map parcel viewer, and I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you, you made a good point. It, this lot looks like Oklahoma. <laughs> and that, to me, obviously affects how, back, how far back you can go so, um, I, you know, I don't, I guess I'd like to hear from the applicant and, and if they can work with, you know, their current setback, then I think it's a non-issue. And 
and I'd like to hear from other members of the board. I, I do think this is a is a really odd looking lot that seems yeah. to me like it creates a hardship. Yeah, no, and I, I agree. I, I, we can the uh, on page 237 of our packet, or at least at, at page 37 of the mine, the drawing that he proposed does have uh, show buildable area in the panhandle of Oklahoma, so to speak. Um, but does anyone, and Ms. Carpenter, you have your hand up, did you have something to, you'd like to say? All right. Ms. Carbonek, did you? Want to uh, I'm that? sorry. Again, I'm having that technical difficulty with clicking the button. It was raised accidentally from the last time. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, if anyone, uh, unless there's any objection, if there is, raise your hand, please. I'll uh, ask the applicant to uh, address the 38 foot uh, proposed setback versus the 28 foot uh, setback that he requested. All right, I, I don't see any, so I think that was the question. Um, so the proposal is, that, or you've heard the discussion of the board, um, and the, the thought is that uh, it, it's been expressed that there there seems to be uh, a hardship, and if we were to allow the two homes that they would like for it to at least uh, be no closer to Warfield than the current home, which I think was 38.1 feet. Okay. I mean, the only hardship that we have on that is going to be because the, the skinny part of the lot really can't be used. I mean, it's just too narrow to use for anything for buildable. And the biggest issue that I'm coming up with is just that I need a one level for my mom because she can't use stairs and being elderly. Um, so I don't know if that consists of the hardship or, or not, but I mean, that's the biggest issue as to why I'm asking for that and just trying to, you know, being the same setback as what. <clears throat> the neighbor has, and then if you follow over to the next lot, um, I, don't, I don't really have anything else to support it with that. Okay. Are there any other questions, Tom, Mr. Lawless? Yeah, I, I'm just trying to figure out exactly where we are in terms of discussing it, whether or not we're working with Christina's uh, proposal or whatever i just want to make sure i vote or at least when we start discussing yeah putting it together the, well we there's not a, there. there's not a motion on the floor yet it was uh, thought that uh, i think that the expression was made and uh echoed by enough board members uh the willingness to consider something um to to, to consider a, a setback but to have that be uh at where the current home is, which is 38 feet. So I, there's, and before it moved to a motion, I'd ask just to hear from the applicant who we just heard from. So, I, you know, I, I will reclose the, unless there, I'm, I'll just ask the board if there are questions, uh, additional questions for the applicant. Um, and then uh, I'll close public hearing again and we can make a decision. So Ms. Carpenter. Uh, yes, what are the proposed footprints for each build, um, each structure? All right, that's that's to the applicant. Did you hear that? Yeah. Okay. A thousand one seventy one. Okay. Thousand one seventy one um, for each. And are they two? Was it two story structures? Two story, yes. Yeah. Two story. Okay. So about a little over two thousand. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Uh, I have a question. So, okay. if is the am I correct here that allowing a variance on the front setback is going to give? I'm looking at this tax parcel map. Allowing the variance on the front is that going to give your neighbors that are just directly behind you? Is it going to give them more room between? your proposed structure and their backyard is that you, do you see what i'm saying is it going to give them more room Correct. Uh, no, i mean it's gonna it'll be the exact same as what it is i mean because there's already a, that five foot setback so it's not going to really give them more nor okay more, uh, back. now 
there won't be anything. It's just grass area in a small area. The small okay. parcel. Parcel. Okay, so the, the, the neighbors in the back, and I'm looking at the, it looks like uh, two houses, A and B, it's it's not going to either give them more room or less room is what you're saying. Correct. And they'll probably, okay. they, they actually will probably be happy because there's some massive trees in that backyard that need to be taken down as well. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's all I had. All right, any, uh, Ms. Carpenter, do you have a question for that bit? Oh, I'm just forgetting about the hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> Fall asleep. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. About the, about about mid June, we're gonna get be perfect at this, and then we'll be back <laughs> together and not have to worry about it anymore. All right. So I look uh, forward to that. <laughs> yeah, me too. If, 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 seeing no other uh, hands up, I, I will close the public hearing again and ask uh, again with with the additional information for thoughts and comments. Uh, Mr. Newton. Uh, again, I, I I think I think if you allow the full setback, then it gets it, you know visually along Warfield, it's gonna it's gonna feel really tight there. Um, I think again the 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 current setback is, seems to be appropriate for the for the site. Okay, uh, Ms. Davis. I agree with Mr. Newton, and if he would make a motion, I would support it. <laughs> I'll make the motion. And is 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 the motion um, to grant the lot size variance and to Correct. and then a thirty eight foot setback, which uh, matches yeah, thirty eight point nine. I think is the okay. Thirty eight point nine um, foot setback, which matches the existing building. Yes. And I'll second okay. that, the hardship being the lot description. All right, so there's a motion and a second. And is there any discussion on the motion? All right, uh, I will, I'm sorry, Ms. Davis. Uh, just for the record, I wanted to make it clear that I was supporting Mr. Newton's motion because I do think that there is a hardship to justify the lot size, the lot size variance but I didn't see a hardship to justify the setback variance, and that's why I supported his motion. Okay. Great, any other discussion or comments on the motion? Then we'll take a vote and start with Mr. Newton. Aye. Mr. Lawless. Aye. Ms. Davis. In favor. Ms. Karpinek. Also in favor. Mr. Pepper. In favor. And I'll vote in favor of that motion too. That passes uh, six to zero. Good luck. Thank you. Next case. Next case for the board to consider is case 2021-15 involving property at 895 Irma Drive. This is a request for a variance from street setback to construct a detached carport. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property is R8. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. This is a site plan that was submitted by the applicant. And finally, the current conditions of the property as well as, oops. Well, you've got the, the conditions up and down the street. My mistake, it looks like I did not get the front of the house. Um, so my apologies for that. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 115? Seeing none, the applicant will have five minutes to make your desired presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Um, my name is Alberto Contreras. I'm here. Um, with Israel Lugo, the homeowner. Um, I'm here on his behalf of the translator and friend of his uh, home builder. And um, uh, he's trying to build this park for it. Um, it's not going to be attached to his existing home. And um, uh, he, was, he was told that as long as he maintains five foot setbacks from the, from the near site, which would be the lower left corner, um, it would be um, applicable. Um, he also did um, send out the um, appeal at 65 people near his um, subdivision. Okay. And um, he, he was knocking on the doors and nobody had told him. 
they were against it. And he also got, he was recommended to get letters of approval and he got letters of approval from his neighbors that they had no problem. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, if you can just leave those on the table and those can be part of the public record. Um, and then just for the board members, uh, they're just presenting uh, letters from the adjacent neighbors and was there a, a survey or document or anything else? Uh, just uh, letters. Just right. letters of approval. Um, as far as what he's building, it's just a, it's, it's a detached cardboard. It's not going to be connected roof-wise to the existing home. Okay. One of the, the questions I had, and, um, and, and, it, and it does seem because of the nature of the driveway and the lots on the curve that it, it would be difficult, at least from my understanding of the site plan, it would be difficult to, you know, take the driveway around to the back or uh, it, it makes sense that the, based on the nature of the lot that why you would want to put a carport here. But what I don't understand is how big it is. Is it a one two car carport? Um, he was initially, he, he had thought of a one car carport, but they told him to do it to carport because he's not going to go past that edge of his property. And so he's doing the back of that, so he's going to have a clearance of like 19 foot, uh, and 19 foot. And it, it, and, it, and it won't have walls, it's just no. uh, four poles and a roof? Yeah, we'll go above and beyond and do it. But I mean, I mean, it, but it's not going to be, it's not going to look like a building. No, no, it's just, it's just a roof wipe. Um, initially, why he wants to build it is because uh, when it rains, there's things in the weather, there's no covering as far as um, for them to be able to get inside. His wife is uh, pregnant and she's going to have to get it. Um, he's trying to make it as easy for her to be able to get from outside of home to her car without um, hardship. Okay. Are there uh, questions from the board? Mr. Newton. Uh, is there currently a porch on the front of the house? Uh, uh, there is. Uh, um, I'm going to ask that. I'm going to have to translate some of sure. so I can get an answer for now. What are the names? What's your conference? I don't know if you need that. Okay. Does does the carport going to come in front of that porch or is it to the no, side of that porch? It's on the side of it. Okay. So his intention was to build a small staircase landing from that carport to that shed. Okay. So how how much in front of that porch will the carport extend? Mm, okay. Quanto va a extender la pared aquí? So it, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding exactly where this is going. So it's going in front of the, you want to do it in front of the porch or uh, straight in with the driveway, like lined up with the driveway? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, you know, it, if, if you're looking at that page 243, uh -huh. if you're able to blow that uh, I think there's a rectangle to the left of the driveway. To the, if you're looking at the house, it's to the left of the house. Is that correct? Yeah, it's on the left side. And are you adding any driveway? No. No pavement. It's already there. You, you, yeah. Everything's paved. You're just putting a cover over what's already paved. And that's not as clear to me on the drawing, but yeah, I, I see. I see that now. Now I understand a little better. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> He is building himself, and I don't know if that takes into account anything, but I can speak for him as far as we work together for a few years, and he will do everything he needs to do to comply with the code. Um, 
getting any expenses. Um, all the holes that you have to dig with rebar, if that's necessary. I don't know. Um, you guys didn't want that. Okay. And any any other questions? Did you all have? Did you have anything else to add? Oh, um, as far as we stand, uh, no. Just as far as they know that he is also color matching and everything so, from Gable and, and like face and stuff like that. So feel wise, it's not going to be um, much different from the from the current. Okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Lawless, I, I didn't see your hand. I'm sorry. That's that's all right. I just can can you articulate what the hardship is? I'm I'm sort of staring at it and with all due respect, I'm having a just trying to figure it out. Help me with the hardship just a touch, please. Um well he wants he wants to build something um that he can when it's raining or when he's parked his car that and, and I'm sorry, that the Ms. Wallace was asking, one of the criteria for uh, voting on a variance is there has to be a hardship, like the lot has a strange shape. And, um, you know, you know, I guess to me, part of that would be, is it possible to, to build, you know, a carport that touches the house or this to the, you know, that goes around the house? That, you uh, know, yeah, it's just, um, it's just a stand of it. Because towards the back of the house, it just it gets way too tight. So you can't finish the driver, so you have to take it all the way around. And even then, you're going to be close to the right side. So you're saying that you would have to relocate the driveway to the right side of the house, or it, because where the current driveway is, you couldn't add on to the house, or so that, and I, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but that's when, when Mr. Wallace asked about a hardship, that's what he's saying. Uh, it basically is, why does it have to go here and why can't it go anywhere else? And this is the, I mean, the, the locks start getting really tight towards the back of the house, so there's really no additional space where it can go. They had, they had told them like couldn't do it in the back, but all the additional costs and work having to go all the way back there would still come with the same problem on the right elevation of the house. Okay. Mr. Lawson, did that, did that address your question or did you have other other thoughts? No, and I appreciate you helping me interpret myself a little bit on that. I think you answered the question, but not necessarily the way that they might have wanted it. Thank you very much, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Newton? Uh, yes. Does, did the house did the house have a garage and it was closed in at one point, or is it? Uh, um, when I, I went and saw his house, it, it had a garage, but when it was sold to them, it was already sold as a the whole The home was like really worked in and he's redone everything, but uh, it was already sold like square footage wise. Uh, so at one point in its history, it had a garage, but when uh, the applicant bought the home, it was already converted into a family, into living space. So it didn't have a garage when you bought the home. Uh, Ms. Karpenick? I'm still having a bit of trouble hearing, um, so you might be able to help me here. Um, what was the answer to how far away from the existing home will the carport be built? Um. Well, from the existing home, he says it's between three to four feet away from, from the house. Did you hear that? He said three, three to four feet away from the house. That's it? <laughs> that yeah. It's going to come towards the street three to four feet? No, no, no. Well, if it's from the street. I mean, no, no, no. It, I think the question was how how close is it to the home? Is that right? How close is it to the street? Okay, I'm sorry. How how far? Yeah, how far is it from the edge of the carport to the street? Uh, we're still we're still a good distance because it's like a 55 foot um, uh, distance right now, and the carport is going to be 
Okay. Uh, Mr. Newton. So, uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that I'm reading, looking at this this site plan correctly, that the rectangle that has 19, 22, and 12 around it, that is the new carport. Is that correct? For the proposed carport? Did you, did you hear that question? Um, is it? It's, it's not. Yeah, it's there's not a rectangle the that, area. No. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, right there. Where it says 19 and 22. That, that okay. All right. Okay, so. Got it. Sorry about this. You can't really see it on. Yeah. It, well, I think that was part of the trouble that uh, the board members had too. Is it that it wasn't clear exactly on this drawing where the carport was. And so, but that is the carport. Any, uh, uh, Mr. Newton. So it appears that it's cut that that carport comes all the way to the uh, to the, the the setback described in the zoning code, and is is completely in front of the contextual center. Is that correct? You said I'm sorry. You you broke up a little bit. You said we sorry. could repeat it. Yeah, uh, so that that carport appears to come all the way to the edge of the um, of the zone zoning code prescribed setback, uh, but it's completely in front of the contextual setback. Is that correct? Yes, and there was a note on here that was made for him that um, stated that. Um, and again, I'm just reading because it's on here. I don't know if it's helpful or not. Said the contextual overlay does not apply to accessory structure. Uh, I was on his application. Yeah, that, that's a. I may ask the codes folks. Uh, that was a question that we were talking about when we were looking at this uh, application, and because when it said that was part of it when we saw accessory structures aren't included in the contextual. That was a mistake by the zoning examiner who took the application. The contextual setback does apply okay. to accessory structures. Did the board hear that? The contextual setback does apply that that was a mistake by the zoning examiner. And when we sent the updated packet, we had included an amended application okay. that had removed that statement. But again, it was after the first board packet went out, right. so you may not have seen Otherwise, that. we wouldn't have been here. Right. All right, Ms. Carpenter. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> so I figured out where the carport's going to be. It's not going to touch the house, but it does look like it is 20 feet from the street, which is what I understand is the platted setback, not necessarily what the zoning code is now requiring because the zoning code is requiring a contextual street setback of 55 feet. So that's the way I'm seeing this site plan. And Ms. Lamb, if you want to correct that, that's fine. But... No, that's, you're correct. Okay, but thanks. I, it, okay. It, yeah, and, and I think it was 20 feet from the property line and maybe an additional 12 to the street. Is that, or were you looking at something else, Christine? Did you... Yeah, I'm looking at, and it's the, you know, what we have in the board packet, it's pixelated. So I'm, but I'm thinking, what I think I see is a 20 foot platted setback that was listed in the description and that this garage or carport is gonna touch that 20 foot setback. So it won't be 35 feet away from the street. Well, I, I was thinking that they, that, you know, but that big dark line, line, but that big dark line property line is a pretty good little chunk away from Irma Drive. So I think that's where they were. To me, that's where I thought the additional 12 feet was. I, mean, I agree with you, it's 20 feet from the property line, but I don't think the property line's on the street. Yeah, the way I was okay. looking at it. Yeah, I'm looking at that now a little bit more, and there's a lot of lines in there. So yeah, I guess yeah. Irma Drive, <laughs> sidewalk, or there's another line, or maybe that's a pipe. It's really hard to read just because it's pixelated. 
Well, it is right. I have the benefit of, a, of an iPad and uh, this blown up as much as it can be and, and reading glasses, too. And I still don't know that I 100 percent get it, but it it appears yeah. to be one of those cases, like you said, where um, they are 20 feet from the property, property. line. But there does appear to be uh, I don't see anything that conflicts with their statement that it would be 32 feet off the street uh, based on what I see. Uh, yeah, gotcha. Thanks. You know, but you know, not not gonna bet the bank on it. Uh, but but that for what I'm looking at, blown up, it does appear that the property line is not on the street. Yeah. Okay. That's a, I think there was another hand up a minute ago, and I don't remember who it was. But I pulled mine back down. Okay. I wasn't gonna call you out, but. Just want to make sure nobody else has any idea of any other questions at this point. All right, seeing no questions, did you all have anything else to add at this point? Okay. Then uh, we'll close the public hearing and uh, discuss. I mean, it, it's it's not, I don't know the specific of this case um, we can talk about, but it is not unusual for the board to um, you know, to, to grant side, uh, carport variances either on the side or in some cases the front or different places of the lot based on the specifics of the case. Yeah, usually the conditions are that uh, the carport not being enclosed, uh, so it doesn't appear to be, um, you know, a, a true habitable structure or, or, you know, and it minimizes the impact uh, being able to see through. I don't know if the board's willing to consider that in this case at some level, but it's not unusual for us to do that. Um, but it would like to hear everybody else's thoughts. Mr. Pepper. Well, uh, <clears throat> I just don't see a hardship. And, and I think that if uh, I'm looking at this this site plan, if you look at the houses to the right, um, especially the first two, not so much the third, that you know this is going to this is going to mess up the alignment, so to speak. And I, I get it that it's not a full structure; it's not going to have walls on it. But I still I don't think that. I don't. <clears throat> I don't think that. Um, I, still, I think you still have to show a hardship, and I just um, maybe I'm missing it, and somebody else can point it out, and I certainly have missed them before, but I don't see one right now. Well, the the, the hardship I would see is, you know, it's on a on a curved part of the lot. The lot's a little bit of a, a fan pie shape, and the orientation of the house, uh, and maybe it was a decision of the previous owner to. Uh, enclose a garage for living space, but and you know on the side of the home where the driveway is. But to me, the hardship is the inability to push the you know carport um, you know closer to the home, you know and or go around the home to have uh, on that side. Um, and so that that's where I see it. But you know I, I, I understand the you know, the point of the. Uh, impact of the neighbors, but you know, he the applicant also brought um, you know letters of support from the adjacent uh, folks, you know, too. So, um, Mr. Laws, you had a, a comment. Hey, I'm, I'm I'm sort of in the same boat with Mr. Pepper, in as much as he bought it knowing what he was getting, and it's almost self-imposed. I mean. I didn't hear anything, and I asked the question, and thankfully you were able to, I think, try to elicit a little more support from the applicant to my question, and I just didn't hear it. So I'm, I guess I'm telegraphing here that you know, I need to be convinced the other way. Yeah, this and this is Mr. Pepper again. I I understand that. I mean, if neighbors do oppose it, 
a variance request, that always makes a difference, and I think it should. I just, I have never, the fact that no one opposes it has never been something I've given a lot of weight to because I've always viewed that that part of our job is to preserve the the character of neighborhoods and 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 the zoning code, not just for people who live in a neighborhood now, but for people who live there in 15 and 20 and 30 and 40 years. So, um, for what it's worth. Is there anybody that that would feel that a, a, a smaller carport, uh, I think they'd said, we'd ask whether it's one or two, and I think they were gonna build two. Is there anybody that uh, that feels like that there would be a case you know, for a, a smaller carport? Or is there other comments or a motion? I, I, this is Mr. Pepper. I'll make a motion to deny the request. Mr. Lawless. I will second that motion. All right. There's a motion uh, on the floor to uh, deny the request because of the lack of hardship? Correct. That's the basis, yes. All right. Uh, is there any comments? Seeing none, uh, we'll take a vote, Mr. Pepper. In favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. Ms. Davis? Um, I'm in favor. Ms. Carpenter? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. And I will vote no, so that motion passes five to one. All right. Good luck. Thank you. And that concludes the board of that. And that meeting. our meeting is concluded and adjourned. Good luck to everybody, and we will see you soon. All right. Thank you. By the way, welcome, Logan. I appreciate it. <laughs>